I'm Greg Johnson. Welcome to CounterCurrents Radio. My guest today is video blogger and commentator Endeavor. Endeavor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on, Greg. You are a YouTuber. You still have a platform at YouTube. You still have a channel at YouTube. And you've been making videos on a wide variety of topics. And I would just like to introduce your work to my audience. So how would you characterize your outlook and your work? What I do is I create dissident right-wing content on YouTube, largely. And mostly my focus is on reactionary politics. So I mostly look at meta politics, political science, philo uh, political philosophy, and things like that uh, from a right-wing reactionary perspective. I do a lot of cr criticism of liberalism, liberal democracy, and egalitarianism, and the uh, superstructure we're living under today in general. And I'd say I'm part of the pro-European sphere, whatever we want to call that today. So um, I would be very much in line with the readers of Countercurrents. Yeah, that was my impression. So how did you come to these views? What kind of education did you have? I'm just curious as to how you arrived at these sorts of ideas. I was born in Toronto in Canada. It's a major cosmopolitan multicultural city. I studied international business when I went to university. But I guess the way that I arrived at these views, what kind of sent me on that uh, path, it wasn't really any like negative experiences you had you had with say um, uh, with migrants or uh, any or multiculturalism or anything like that. The the negative thing that the negative experience that really kind of pushed me in that direction was just kind of finding, I guess, just finding the uh, modern world very uh, empty and vacuous. And um, I I guess what I f first found an interest I first took an interest in was history took an interest in history and then eventually I took an interest in philosophy and it it generally pushed me towards the right politically and I'd say through the kind of the process of uh, a few years I kind of went down what you know what the left calls the right-wing radicalization rabbit hole <laughs> uh, and then I eventually arrived at uh, you know dissident right-wing uh, pro-european reactionary, politics through a process of, you know, reading history and really gaining an appreciation for Western civilization and not really seeing the various things that resonated with me reflected in modern liberal society. So I'd say that's really what sent me, uh, that, that's really kind of how I arrived where I am politically. So who are some of the thinkers, some of the writers who have influenced you? I'd say one of the biggest influences on me was definitely Mencius Moldbug. You know, I'd say his book uh, or his blog post, which is essentially a book length, the open letter to the open to open minded progressives, I think it best uh, described how power works and uh, really the lie that liberal democracy is. It, it spoke a lot of truths that many people may may subconsciously realize about um, the way that uh, the, our politics works, but they're they're not uh, acknowledged. So, for example, like the the amount of power that um, the left has, it doesn't come from them winning elections. It doesn't come from them being more popular. It's through controlling the media, controlling the universities, controlling uh, having corporations and finance on their side. So that was a big one for me. I'd say another one was um, G.K. Chesterton. I really enjoyed a, a few of his books, especially uh, Orthodoxy. I thought was a was probably my favorite uh, work of his, and then a few other uh, a few other authors. Um, I'm, I'm a big critic of the Enlightenment on my channel. I've actually have a running series where I've looked at various concepts from the Enlightenment de and deconstructed them. I would say if I had to choose one uh, a writer from the Enlightenment I like, I'd say Thomas Hobbes, and a few others. Maybe Patrick Deneen has written some interesting books. Nick Land. Um, just a couple of right-wing uh, and reactionary authors which uh, have been influential on me. What do you like about Hobbes? That's an interesting choice for an anti-modernist because so much of modern liberalism really comes from Hobbes. My favorite part of Hobbes is more the way that he really uh, uh, portrays human nature as this, uh, that man in nature is um, brutal and life is 
short, really, and uh, not very pleasant. And uh, I guess his the the call for order and for uh, um, authority that Hobbes had in in, in his writing, uh, I'd say that while he, I, I don't know if I would say I agree with everything he wrote. Uh, he was kind of the anti uh, Locke and that, and the anti uh, Rousseau, and that he actually rec- recognized human nature as being just uh, brutish and uh, and violent. And it's it's just a concept that uh, is so contrary to the liberal notion we have today that mankind is just this. Um, uh, and, and inside the heart of every human is, uh, you know, regardless of what society they originate from is some uh, enlightened, uh, peaceful liberal who just needs the right education and that, you know, you just need the right, uh, you just need the right, um, uh, you just need, you just need the right institutions around them to bring that out. And I, I'd say it's like, it's just tearing down that, that one liberal, one, that one liberal myth. That's what I'd say was the most influential on me f- uh, from Hobbes. Yeah, that, I think is what's true in Hobbes as well. Hobbes really regards mankind as fundamentally evil. I don't know if it, if he's like pure evil or anything like that, but there is this element of savagery in humanity that requires the state. The idea that man is by nature good and that savagery is something that's created by civilization added by civilization, and therefore can be removed by changing civilization, that we're perfectible in that way. That, I think, is one of the great follies of the Enlightenment. And that's really an idea that you get in Rousseau, I think, especially. Rousseau talked about the natural goodness of man, the perfectibility of human nature, and things like that. And I don't think Hobbes would have any of that. No, definitely not. I, I it, It's the... um. It's the notion that uh, man's imperfectibilities or man's uh, imperfections are the result of institutions. They're the result of uh, a fault in human institution that has failed to create this uh, enlightened, egalitarian, rational being, which uh, really, in my opinion, runs contrary to uh, what I'd say is observ- observable uh, sociologically and uh, anthropologically throughout human history that what you see is uh, in these in, in you know more primitive societies and more uh, um, less technologically advanced times, people were a lot more violent because that was really that that was the only way for them to survive. Um, and the notion that uh, that you know the Vikings pillaged uh, and killed people because they you know they had never they never had the opportunity to read John Locke or read John uh, Jacques Rousseau, and they were never just enla- uh, taught enlightenment liberalism. Is um, it's uh, it's fantasy as far as as far as I can tell, because these ideas really uh, liberalism could not exist in a pre-modern society because the technology and the uh, the decadence that requ- that is really required to make liberal society work. Um, is not there in, you know, in, in a uh, pre-modern society, the brutality of man, it, it served a purpose in that it actually allowed people to survive. Many times it was, you either go off and pillage this other tribe or this other kingdom or whatever, or your, your, your group dies off. And this entire notion that, uh, that that's something that can be just educated out of humans. Uh, it's one of the major, uh, it's, it's one of these uh, concepts like the first video I made in my enlightenment series was about the entire idea of man ever becoming enlightened, that we could ever through education, through human institution, fundamentally change the man away from his brutal nature. And that somehow uh, you could construct a, a society that's, that runs contrary to that. I'd say that for me, that was the big, that was the, that's the big, that's the biggest fault of the enlightenment is the idea that you can even, uh, you can even change human nature uh, to begin with. The, the thing that makes it conceivable that everybody can be part of one big pacified world is plenty, technological progress, economic progress, the abolition of scarcity, consumerism, and so forth. We have so much more stuff available to us today. And it's easy to believe that if people just have enough stuff to amuse them and satisfy them, 
that man's violent side will just disappear because if you get rid of economic necessity, right, why would people fight? Of course, Hobbes knew better. Hobbes knew that people fought over things like principles and honor. They didn't just fight over resources. But the great hope of the Enlightenment was that you could pacify humanity by giving them a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, when the ability of modern society to deliver all the narcotizing diversions ends or is tested or wobbles a little bit, then you realize how thin this crust of civility really is and how quickly people can descend into barbarism again. And, and that, I think, is, is, a, is a real refutation of this liberal progressive notion that essentially human nature is perfectible. We didn't perfect human nature. We didn't really domesticate man. We have just distracted and narcotized people and also rewired their psychology a good bit to trivialize them so that they are more focused on just getting stuff and consuming stuff rather than, say, fighting over principles or fighting over honor or fighting over identity. Yeah, and what I'd say is uh, what, why I feel like these Enlightenment ideas really do need to be critiqued today is that they seem to be standing in the way of of actually addressing many of the problems of the modern world. So, you know, uh, I guess um, we can just look at at the uh, the the societal project that's really being imposed upon the West today, the multicultural uh, liberal project that's really just being used to. Uh, facilitate the destruction of our civilization. Uh, all these ideas from the Enlightenment they block any kind of solution to uh, to the the crisis that we face. So, um, for example, we this the concept of like human rights. It's that you know you, you uh, to to de to defend yourself to actually uh, pursue your own um, uh, the the survival of your own. Um, uh, peoplehood, your own, your own ethnic group, your own nation, nation, uh, or, or so on. And that would be, uh, that would be against human rights. It would be, uh, of, you, you'd have to violate people's human rights uh, that are passed down by the United Nations in order to do that. Uh, and it's really just an arbitrary concept or, um, the idea that there is a marketplace of ideas is another one that I've looked at on my channel. The idea that, uh, there even ever has been a debate in that, you know, we, that, uh, we got here because their best ideas won out and the, and the, really the way to, uh, the, if the only way, the way out of it is really to just debate your way out of it and that you'll be taken seriously in a liberal democracy that's going to, uh, uh, just allow, allow you to, um, advance ideas that, that people in power really don't want, uh, really don't want. So there's just so many, uh, there's just so many concepts that have, uh, been handed down by the enlightenment that are influential on politics today. Cause I don't, I don't want to paint it with too broad of a brush. I don't want to say that every single enlightenment thinker think thought the same, cause that's clearly not true. But the, what I more look at is the ideas that are influential today and that really are preventing us from, uh, that are really preventing us from actually, uh, advancing, it, uh, as our right wing, uh, right wing cause. One thing that I have strongly believed about the Enlightenment is that the underlying narrative of the, of the Enlightenment, the very idea of Enlightenment, is progress from darkness, namely superstition, to science and reason, hence Enlightenment. My sense about the human being and human history is that we, we're not becoming less irrational over time. I believe in a kind of principle of the conservation of irrationality. And if irrationality isn't focused on, say, revealed religion or something like that, it's just going to migrate to some other thing that it's going to affix itself to. And it's going to be some kind of substitute religion, like modern egalitarianism, like Marxism, and so forth. So what are your thoughts about religion specifically and the substitute religions that rule us today? I myself am a Protestant. I am a Christian. Uh, but I think that religion in general is a very good way to uh, facilitate 
uh, healthy civilizational structure. So if we take Christianity, for example, some of the things that it uh, helped facilitate were culture and uh, f- uh, the creation of families, the implementation of uh, morality. And r- really, it w- w- from, a sec- from a secular perspective, and I think a good uh, someone who probably could say this a lot better than me is Edward Dutton, uh, that from a secular perspective, uh, religion is a very good way to facilitate um, uh, healthy, uh, healthy civilizational um, uh, strength uh, structures. So, uh, what what he often points out is how religious people have more children; they are more ethnocentric. And um, from a you know a Darwinian uh, perspective, they are the ones who are passing on their their genes, which is as a, as a mammalian uh, species. That's what we are designed to do. We're supposed to perpetuate our genotypes and religion is something that allows us to do that what we see today with egalitarianism is that it's kind of become this secular religion but unlike say religions like christianity which facilitate healthy uh, uh, a healthy civilization it creates a destructive one so uh, what we really see is that um for the left egalitarianism has taken on religious fervor so when you see at one of these uh, universities, and now there's like dozens of famous memes on the internet of some leftist college student, you know, freaking out at some conservative speaker being on their campus. You know, you can see the uh, that famous picture with that uh, girl uh, with the short hair with uh, and the glasses. Her like veins are popping out of her neck. Her teeth are clenched. For someone to react like that uh, to, I, I don't exactly remember what exactly was said, but it it's reminiscent of, say, um, what, you, what you'd expect from an Islamist if you burned the Quran in front of him or what a the way that a Catholic priest in 19th in century Ireland uh, would react if you blasphemed Christ in front of him. Uh, it's not a. It's not. It's not a simple disagreement with someone's arguments on an ideological level. It's a uh, religious. Uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a. Um, how do I how do I describe it? It's a r- religious reaction in that um, they're reacting in the same way as somebody who bla- who blasphemed, who disrespected something they hold sacred, and that for the left is egalitarianism, the fundamental idea that uh, all humanity is this equal interchangeable blank slate and that um and that the only cause for inequality is oppression and what you see the left has actually done uh, a very good job at doing uh unfortunately for us is that um they've tied uh because you know you can make the argument that left-wing politics has always been about egalitarianism it's always been about equality to, in, in some degree but what they've done is they've cre- they've taken people of European descent and, and the uh, and uh, us really advocating our own interests and our, and pursuing uh, our, our and you know having any kind of pride in our civilization anything that anything that can be considered pro-white and they've been and they've turned this into the ultimate sin they, they, they've told turned this into the ultimate uh, evil that the metaphysical evil that they refer to as racism which is the absolute antithesis to their metaphysical good of equality. And that's why what you really see with the egalitarian left today is that their, um, their, their core principle is that they're anti-white. It's that the underlying principle that, um, that underlines all left-wing thought is that, uh, they'll, they're, that they'll always take the most anti-white conclusion on, on any given issue. And that's really how they, they've used, they, they've kind of used egalitarianism as a religion to weaponize itself politically, I find. And I think from the right, you will need a right-wing religion. Now, I I don't expect people to, I'm a Christian, but I don't expect, you know, the masses to convert to Christianity uh, en masse. I don't know if that's feasible, but I think you do need a right-wing religion that, um, that, in which order, order and stability and pro- and I think also pride in European civilization will take on a religious fervor in the same way that egalitarianism and and the anti-white uh, narrative has for the left. Yeah, I think that is possible. I've written an essay on racial civil religion where I argue that 
we really need something like that that would unite people of European descent around the preservation of our race and culture and our various nations. I do think that we can elevate that to the status of something that's sacred, like a civil, civil religion where people really, really take seriously the, the founding principles and the heroes of their societies. We can do that, I think, with race. You know, the, the fact that leftists get triggered so easily and <laughs> really go ballistic when you contravene their taboos and moral absolutes, etc., really indicates that there is no such thing as the Enlightenment's vaunted free market of ideas. Because the free market of ideas, the open society, whatever you want to call it, is a society where there's nothing sacred, where anything can be discussed, where people have freedom of discussion, freedom of thought, etc. And we're, we're supposed to believe that that's going to lead to the best ideas floating to the top and winning out. The left doesn't allow that. They, they demand that whenever they're being oppressed. They say, wouldn't it be nice if we had tolerance and free, a free market of ideas if you would just let go of your guns and your God and you know of the stuff you cling to, be a little more open. And they convince you that, yeah, maybe we'd all be better off that way. But as soon as you contravene their idea of what's sacred, then suddenly we're right back where we started with religious repressions and shaming rituals and witch burning hysterias and things like that. And uh, it really is very tiresome. It's so tiresome because it's so fake. I mean, what, what, what these people stand for is obviously not something that they themselves can even practice. They only appeal to it when it's advantageous as a weapon against their enemies they never apply it to themselves. I, I think that uh, one guy who really uh, disproves this, this entire idea of, um, uh, well, I mean, I think that I think that probably one guy who's the best example of uh, the hypocrite who you know claims enlightenment values, who claims to be uh, you know uh, rational, rational and open to discourse, is Steven Pinker. Now. Um, He's, uh, you know, a, a staunch defender of the Enlightenment. He wrote an entire book about uh, the values of the Enlightenment and uh, how it's uh, going to bring about human flourishing and uh, how we need science and reason and that tradition and religiosity are all outdated superstitions and sources of delusion. Um, but what you really see with Steven Pinker is that liberalism for him supersedes um Rationality it supersedes science and it supersedes um, the uh, the uh, the free market of ideas. It supersedes all of the values that he uh, egalitarianism for him supersedes all the values he claims uh, to be supporting. And a good example of this is that um, he wrote an entire book about the blank slate. And uh, of course, I'll get I'll give him credit that he at least admits that the blank slate is wrong and that it's not true. And he himself has even given a speech before in which he claimed that uh, the, the reason that Jews are uh, successful uh, disproportionately, his own ethnic group, is that they have, uh, per, um, they have particularly high IQs. Um, and he's perfectly fine with, with, with saying it in that, in that case. But then if you had said to Steven Pinker, well, do you think that if, if the reason that Jews are successful is because of their high IQs, possibly could it, could, could it also be the case that the reason Europeans are more successful on average than Africans might also be to, uh, due to a disparity of, of IQs. And that if that's the truth, does it do, does it really make sense to punish, uh, Europeans for the fact that Africans are less successful than them? And does, you know, egalitarianism and multiculturalism really make sense? He wouldn't have any of that. He'd call you a fascist and, uh, and um, a racist and, th and that you're just this irrational bigot who just hates people that, that aren't like you. And uh, he, he'll just throw the entire um, he would just throw the entire um, uh, idea of the free market, of rationality, of science out, out the window because fundamentally he's an egalitarian. And for him, that supersedes uh, that that supersedes the values that he proclaimed to believe in. 
Yeah, yeah. He's a very, very slippery, disappointing character. The Blank Slate is an amazing piece of work. It's, it's very important. The Rousseauian idea of the perfectibility of man is basically the Blank Slate. And, of course, Locke actually uses the term tabula rasa. Uh, it's, it's the idea that, and especially morally, not just epistemologically, but morally, we come into the world with all this potentiality. And if we're bad, if we turn out violent and angry or whatever, that is the fault of society, not the fault of our nature. That, that idea has been thoroughly overthrown by modern biology. And Pinker really, I thought, brilliantly demolished all that within the realm of biology. But he won't take it down the next step towards the political conclusions that follow from that. He still wants to, he still wants to maintain the Enlightenment, uh, Enlightenment liberalism uh, in particular. Yeah, what you see with a lot of the um, the guys who claim to believe in scientism that that they want to you know base uh, social policy on science and just the facts, you know they'll never once step outside the Overton window. They won't go against the zeitgeist if it even if uh, science tells them that they'll they'll stay within the uh, they'll they'll stay they'll stay within the Overton window. I mean, a great example of that was um, our our mutual friend uh, Morgoth uh, from Morgoth's Review. He did a brilliant takedown of Richard Dawkins about how uh, Dawkins will um, wrote an entire book about the selfish gene, and um, it, which basically says that you know uh, I haven't read the entire book myself, but it's basic. It, what it basically says is that people will pursue the the the, the good of their gene. That it, it, it makes sense from a uh, reproductive strategy to do that. I mean, that's a pretty good argument for ethno nationalism, though. But Dawkins himself is he supports mass immigration. He's pro globalism. He's pro multiculturalism. And he'll call people who uh, believe that racist. Uh, he'll right. he'll call us racists, even though that that the entire concept of racism itself, it's a, it's a, um, a fabricated con a concept within the last hundred years. There's nothing, you know, uh, scientific about it. It's a. Uh, it's something that's metaphysical and something that uh, requires kind of the aforementioned egalitarian religion in, in order to really take seriously. Yeah, genetic similarity theory, which follows directly from Dawkins' selfish gene, is the foundation for ethno-nationalism as I understand it. I, I make that argument in my White Nationalist Manifesto, and I'm basing that particular argument on, on Philippe Rushton's work. He laid out in a number of very powerfully argued papers the connection between genetic similarity theory and ethnic nationalism. Uh, Frank Salter has, has built on that same basic idea. I, I think it's an unimpeachable biological case for ethno-nationalism, not just racial nationalism, but even ethno-nationalism within races, because you know, white people as a as a biological race, that's not a political unit. The political unit are peoples, nations, people who share a language and a culture and a history. And those people are usually, of course, more genetically related to one another than people who speak different languages and have different cultures. And even fine grained distinctions of relative genetic difference matter in terms of, of people's willingness to cooperate with one another, to sacrifice for the common good, to, to basically practice pro-social virtues. Because the selfish gene argument really leads to a limited form of altruism because it is perfectly reasonable if the genes want to reproduce themselves that the individual that carries that gene be willing to actually sacrifice his life if that will lead to the propagation, the better propagation of the genes that he shares with other people of his tribe. So if you sacrifice your life uh, for your tribe, that's actually a genetically selfish thing to do. For as an individual, it's altruistic, but your genes are being very, very selfish. But we can be altruistic towards others because they share our genetic nature. 
And the closer a society is genetically to one another, the more solidarity there is. And that's been amply proven. Societies like Iceland and Denmark are among the most genetically homogeneous societies in the world, and they're also among the happiest. They're among the most harmonious uh, because you just have more pro-social virtue the closer people are to one another genetically. And I use the example of identical twins because there's no phenomenon on earth that's more uncanny than hanging out for a while with identical twins because they have so much genetic similarity, namely they're the same genetically, that they can practically read one another's minds, <laughs> finish one another's sentences. And that level of harmony would be ideal in some way for a society. And the, the further we get from that genetic identity, the greater conflict comes into human relationships and the, the greater amount of selfishness. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a powerful argument and people like Dawkins will have none of it. Well, I mean, it just goes to show that um, there aren't, we aren't living in that kind of liberal uh, open society that, uh, you know, someone like Karl Popper would have described because um, there are certain ideas that are simply just not allowed to be discussed. There's certain ideas that you are simply are simply off the table, and um, and you know they've created that entire um, cultural, you know, pseudo religious uh, uh, superstructure in order to uh, essentially prevent certain ideas from ever entering the realm. So it, you know you could. Uh, you can have the uh, arguments, but then there, there just seems to be that uh, it, it just seems that um, uh, all the uh, institutions uh, of power in the West really seem to be uh, uh, colluding to prevent certain ideas from ever actually being uh, discussed and ever actually uh, being um, considered as uh, viable political options. Yeah, exactly. And it's so ironic that somebody like Dawkins writes a book called The God Delusion and he thinks he's banishing irrationality from his life. He shooted out the front door and it crept in the back door and has occupied his whole outlook on morals and politics, basically. The, the brilliant line that Morgoth used was that Dawkins had rationalized himself into insanity. You know, there's certain things that uh, you don't really need to rationalize and, and you never really, uh, and uh, people never really needed to. Certain things like, like the family, like uh, reproduction, that was just something that something that uh, has always been part of human society. That things like marriage and uh, and the family unit and uh, and things like this, because they're they they work. They're they that's why they become traditions. But you know, tradition is not really something that is uh, rational. It's something that uh, people generally generally believe. Uh, but it it serves a purpose. You know, when when you look at uh, the effects of uh, Kind of the uh, anti-traditional push uh, from the last, you know, 50, 60 years. We can now see the uh, the actual effects of that. But the traditions that were um, that were deconstructed, they what we can see now is that they were serving a purpose, but they never needed to be rationalized. They were just something that people believed in. Um, they believe they they kind of had that either they had kind of had a religious belief in. And uh, G.K. Chesterton actually had said um, that if you run into a fence, don't tear the fence down. Ask why the fence is there. And I'd say that that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the um, the purpose that tradition saw, uh, served because people can't all be rational individuals. People can't, you know, go through life, uh, you know, looking at all the evidence on a fact sheet and, uh, you know, search and doing all this research and then looking for the politician who's uh policies lining up exactly with all the research they've done nobody operates that way they operate on an on an ir irrational basis and you do kind of need a uh, you do kind of need a culture which uh, facilitates that into something healthy yeah one of the things that tradition does that civilization does is that it allows us to avoid all the trial and error of previous generations we don't have to sweat like Newton and Leibniz did to know calculus, to do calculus. Uh, we don't have to in reinvent the wheel. And we, we, we gladly take these things over. They're handed to us. They're just given. And 
we should look at institutions in the same way and not just think, well, there's this fence here. This is obviously some arbitrary thing that we can discount. You know, it's just a relic of the of superstition, right? It's a relic of the past. It's the old way. You know, we're, we're going to start anew, raise this fence. You know, let's have a tabula rasa and start anew with some plan. That's very, very foolish because it turns out that most of these traditions that exist were arrived at through trial and error. And they've mm -hmm. been handed to us so that we don't have to reinvent them. And one of the great lessons of the, well, it's really starting with the French Revolution and going forward with all the different other liberal revolutions is we have discovered <laughs> the, the, the rationality of institutions that we despised and, and disdained as irrational and wanted to get rid of. Yeah, and I'd say that uh, when in, in regards to uh, tradition and uh, really in religion facilitating a stable society um, uh, politically, I'd say that's something that also really helps this is culture. And, and I, you know, I think that's why uh, myself and uh, many of us on the right are so interested in in culture and films and literature and uh, and things like that is because culture really uh, gives people a uh, a. Um, it gives their life meaning and it, and it, it gives them really a motivation to uh, both love and protect that, you know, their, that civilizational uh, foundation. So, you know, things like uh, um, different uh, cultural norms, uh, different, uh, um, you know, celebrations, holidays and such, uh, you know, there's plenty of examples. Uh, these, these things, uh, were, th these were the things that, you know, people would go to war to, def to defend. This is, these, this is what really kind of made them feel like they were part of, uh, the aforementioned, uh, ethnic group, if we want to put it in, in, uh, simple terms that, uh, they, that, 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 that they were trying to defend. And, uh, you know, rationality is something that is really destructive towards culture as well. You know, you can take uh, because, you know, the culture and traditions aren't really rational in the sense that uh, if, if you take, for example, a, a rural community in some uh, town in, let's say, Bulgaria, and every year they go to this the town square and they perform this dance and sing this song and have this feast on this specific day of the year. Um, none of that's really r rational. I mean, you can say, well, why, why do they do this dance? Why, do, why do they do, why, do, why does it have to be this song? Why does it have to be this food? And the answer is because, um, that's, that's what makes them who they are really. And, uh, it, it it's something that gives, that gives their, their life meaning and it's, it's irrational, but, uh, it is, some, but culture is something that also helps facilitate the, uh, healthy civilizational structures. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's really valuable. One of the things that is very clear about reasoning in politics and even ethics is that you know, people do not reason back to some kind of philosophical system or f system of first principles and things like that. They go as far as this judgment. This is who we are. This is what we're comfortable with. This is who we are. It's a, it's a question of identity. And I think that one of the things that the right has to defend is the legitimacy of just saying that identity is a trump card, identity, identity is an ultimate thing, and uh, that politics is legitimately structured around identity questions, identity issues, that it is not legitimate to basically construct politics in such a way that any group of people loses who they are in the process. If you are asked to play a game where you can only lose, uh, you, you shouldn't play. And multiculturalism as it's played today is a game, especially that Europeans can only lose. Yeah. And, you know, I think that I guess the longing for identity was one thing that that was probably that that I, I'd say that might have been the, the first thing that kind of sent me on my uh, political journey to where I am now. You know, um, I'm uh, an Anglo-Canadian. I'm uh, ethnic. I'm ethnically Scottish, but my family has been in Canada for 
well over a century. Um, but uh, it is something that uh, it, it's really it's really it's really hard to nail down for me. But I'd say that I kind of identify more with a uh, the broader context of of Europe and of European civilization. Um, I don't want to I, I don't want to downplay the 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 um, I don't want to downplay the variation between European peoples because that certainly exists. But um, for example, a, f- a few things that appealed to me really, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I was younger and kind of sent me on on that path. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I saw the film the films uh, Gettysburg and Gods and Generals, uh, films about the American Civil War. When I uh, and um, I actually made a video about that and really the influence it had on me. And you know. It, I'm not an, Amer- an American, so it wasn't my country it was about. But, you know, it, it, I feel like it was a film that really spoke to a, a deeper uh, Europeanness. ness that uh, that would that's something I, I, that I found that I found so attractive and that I really had a longing for. Um, another thing was when I, I when I visited uh, South Africa, I know that um, uh, today it's it's not it's obviously a, a country in a, not a very good shape, uh, not not a very good situation for um for Europeans there, but, uh, there, uh, certain things like the, the, um, visiting, uh, the Cecil Rhodes Memorial where, um, a, you know, a man of the British empire would have overlooked the Cape and, you know, he would have, uh, he, he would have overlooked some, a, a um, he, he would have overlooked this grand civilizational project or meeting the Afrikaners in South Africa or visiting Victoria Falls and see in Zimbabwe, which used to be Rhodesia, and overlooking the falls from where uh, from where David Livingston uh, saw them over 150 years ago, the, it, it kind of it speaks to it. It kind of speaks to a, a you know a, um, a deeper European spirit, and and uh, it, it's some it's something that I, I think uh, may, maybe that maybe that's kind of what's going to resonate with people uh, a lot more than uh, a lot more today because. The situation in, say, Canada and the United States, especially, is that we've, in many ways, lost a lot of our traditional ethnic uh, identities. And that, you know, in, in America, you basically just have uh, you just have white. I don't. I, I know there's still s- slight variations, but um, and it's kind of becoming the same way in Canada. And who knows that might be the same way in Europe. But um, that that that's something that I'd say was very appealing to me. It was kind of appealing to the broader context of European civilization. Not only have you done videos on things like the Enlightenment and European history and identity, you've also done things on popular culture, and you have a recent video out on the Pixar movie WALL-E. And I, I was intrigued by that. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Do you want to talk a bit about your thoughts on popular culture and maybe that particular movie? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, I, I'd say that popular culture is something that uh, is really deteriorating, especially within the last decade. I mean, you can just look at a lot of these uh, vacuous, big budget films, which like the, the Star Wars film, the Marvel films, and uh, they really just seem very vacuous today. And I'd say that, you know, that's why, that's why I am a lot more interested in, I guess, what we could call um, a, the, a right-wing counterculture, which uh, I, I, I hope it is emerging. Uh, the film Wally, though, in particular, uh, this was actually a, a gem that I, I think uh, uh, that I found. You know, um, we often think of Disney as kind of one of the uh, as one of the major proponents of Globo Homo as one of these companies that uh, is just churning out this propaganda. But uh, you know, when you, a lot of their successful films actually have a lot of uh, good right wing messaging in them, and I thought that Wally was a was a good example of that. Uh, what you see in Wally is the, is a um, is an Earth that's been destroyed by uh, been destroyed by consumerism and capitalism and uh, just uh, the ex and just human consumption. Uh, and the the arc of the film is that you know the, the humans are are going to are rediscovering a more authentic and a more uh, a more fulfilling way of life because they 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 exist in this uh perpe- this system of perpetual consumption in which they have infinite material uh material wealth and uh, endless stimulation yet their lives are just empty and vacuous 
And if it's a critique of capitalism, it's a critique of capitalism from the right because it portrays a world in which capitalism has achieved a post-scarcity society in that, you know, the, the leftist critique that it oppresses people, that it makes people poor isn't really, isn't really, doesn't really work there because what you see in the film is that they have everything they want, uh, materially, but, uh, spiritually they they, they, they live a, a spiritually dead life. Disney bought Pixar, which made WALL-E. But Pixar sort of was its own thing for a while, and it had its own ethos. And the films that they made were really remarkably healthy and had some good values in them. I think of The Incredibles, for instance, or I thought Ratatouille had really positive values in it. And it was very Eurocentric as well. I thought the same about The Incredibles as well. It's a, it's a, I mean, there's so many great themes in The Incredibles, like the theme of family uh, and uh, the the idea that the, the villain, um, he's I mean, essentially an egalitarian. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, what's, what's great about the, the villain in um, Incredibles is that um, he's undoubtedly he's undoubtedly evil. So there's none of there's none of this like that. He, you know, he was uh, um, there's none of this moral relativism in The Incredibles. The, the villain is undoubtedly evil. However, you know, he actually he's not just bad for the sake of being bad. He actually has a a um, a, a really deep motivation for uh, his resentment of uh, the superheroes in, in The Incredibles. And it boils down to um, the fact that um, so, that some pe- that, you know, people aren't all equal. It's that he couldn't he just he could never be that. And that's where that kind of hatred and evil w- really came from in the case of Syndrome in The Incredibles. Yeah, yeah. I really found it to be a totally delightful film and something that I would show a kid and not fear that they're going to be corrupted in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one thing, one thing I thought of was the, uh, what used to be called like the Disney magic. So, uh, the princess and the castle and the handsome prince who, uh, who comes and rescues her. And, you know, it's every, every, you know, uh, every 10 year old daughter's dream is to be a, a Disney princess. Um, the, 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 that Disney magic, the idea of the Disney princess, it's something that appeals to hierarchy. Um, it, it appeals to status, a longing for, uh, to really to have high status. And, you know, I, I think the reason that a lot of these modern Disney films are just so awful is that they try to cram egalitarianism in with that. And it just doesn't work because, um, you know, no, no young, uh, girl identifies with a, uh, you know, if a disabled, overweight, transgendered, black Muslim princess, because, uh, it's, they, they, they instinctually know that a princess is someone of high status and that's something that they long for. They long, it, it, it appeals to the, um, the beauty of the, that hierarchy creates. And uh, I think that that's one of the things that was really, that I guess, um, I think that's one of the things that made Disney so successful. Um, and that's why I think a lot of their uh, current films are falling flat. Yeah, it's very, very hard uh, to relate to this woke propaganda. And these companies are being punished for it. And I'm I'm really, really glad. Even something that is, in many objective ways, bad, like the original Star Wars trilogy, you know, they had a bit of diversity, et cetera, et cetera, a bossy princess, things like that. It still seems infinitely more healthy than any of the Disney Star Wars stuff. And the original Star Wars was something that was really, really dear to a whole generation of people. And this new stuff is just less interesting. It it doesn't resonate as much. People don't really buy the Finn action figures or the Admiral Holda dolls and all these completely worthless, woke stereotype characters that they have been cramming into these new movies. And I, and I think that's good. And I, I, I know there's a whole lot of ruin in Disney because it's such a big corporation, but I hope that if these things start failing, maybe they'll just let the Pixar people do more of their stuff because 
Pixar has a good, you know, formula. It, it's wholesome. It, it, it appeals to a lot of people. And it appeals to non-whites. One of the things that is so false about this diversity propaganda that we've got to have one of every in each thing, right, is that Japanese and Chinese and probably Africans too, they actually would like to have movies that are about white people. They find that interesting. They wouldn't feel like it, it's forbidding or alienating to them. They find it fascinating. One of the best examples that I saw of this recently was I watched the Miyazaki film Kiki's Delivery Service. Have you seen that? Uh, no, I haven't. Well, it's, it's one of the Miyazaki Studio Ghibli cartoons. Okay, It's an animated film. And it is set in Europe. It's hard to pin down exactly what country it's supposed to be in, but the feel of it is that it's either Germany or maybe Sweden or some place along the Baltic. Northern Europe, along the Baltic Sea, maybe Denmark, something like that. And it's, it's magical. It, it's quintessentially European. And the Japanese love that. That's why they come to Europe. They want Europe to be European. That attracts them. And so I, I think that the arguments that are made for junking anything distinctly European up uh, or, or ev evicting it from, say, Disney, right, which is definitely Disney's heritage was to be very European, well, that, that's self-defeating. Uh, and the, the, the greatest proof of that is that you have a Japanese studio that's creating movies set in Europe because that's what they want. And it's not full of diversity. What you see with these modern films is that they're essentially creating a culture and they're that, that uh, is designed to facilitate the uh, societal project that's going on. So, you know, that they, they can't have a, they, they, you know, they can't have a European cast when, they're trying to replace you in, in your countries. When they're trying to uh, flood your countries with people from the third world, they can't uh, have you watching a film where you see a world without diversity. So, you know, it's something that is very fundamentally uh, uh, aimed at um, at globalism. It's aimed at facilitating this project, yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which you see in, of course, like the Star Wars film. I thought Keith Wood said it well that, when you see the Star Wars, the recent Star Wars film, which I didn't watch, but uh, he said it was a, the first film that was ever purely product and no uh, story and no no art. So what it essentially was was it uh, had a bunch of action scenes for uh, the big budget. Um, it uh, had it appealed to woke capital, so it had the independent woman, the Hispanic guy, the black guy, and. Um, and then, of course, like the messaging is uh, and all the villains are these angry white guys who yell their heads off. The messages like tear down hierarchy and um, and, and then, you know, they'll even have like a uh, they'll even have this uh, uh, same sex kiss scene. But then they'll make it short. And uh, what Keith Woods pointed out is that it, in the film, it was short and only lasted like two seconds so that they could just edit it out for China because they need to sell it to the Chinese market as well. Right. Uh, it, it's 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 pro it's um it, it's art that really reflects globalism. It really reflects the uh, the emptiness of the of the of the society that they're creating. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the the irony is that um uh, cosmopolitanism and uh that that, that culture it it it, it pur 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 purports to be representative. It purports to uh um you know be inclusive and the entire i guess you could say project of multiculturalism purports to be to help the minorities and help uh, uh the the non the non whites and stuff but uh what it ends up doing is it ends up robbing everyone of uh a a an authentic genuine culture that, that they identify with and that uh essentially no one is satisfied by it it robs europeans of their culture and it robs non europeans of a way of escaping into a European fantasy world, a European culture. I know a lot of people from Japan and the kinds of movies that they love are the sound of music. <laughs> and they would, they would not want to watch the sound of music if it had a multicultural cast because that's fake, 
right? Mm-hmm. They they just wouldn't enjoy that. They they come to Europe, especially around Christmas time, for the Christmas markets. Why? Because it's an uber European experience. They don't come to Europe to see Muslims and black people. They don't want to see black men in dreadlocks or women in burqas. Nobody goes to England to see that. The English might pretend that that's a great draw, but nobody goes to England to see that. And we we just have to be real. Yeah, multiculturalism isn't enriching us. It's impoverishing us. And that's what it's supposed to do. And it doesn't really help anybody because everybody in a multicultural society is alienated. Mm-hmm. It's, it's no way to live. Uh, and well, everybody should have a home where they feel at home. Yeah. And what you see with a lot of the younger generations. So it's like, say that you get a, uh, a Pakistani uh, family that moves to, uh, I don't know, London or Toronto or someplace in someplace in the West. You know, they the father might be a conservative Muslim who uh, demands that his kids adhere to, you know, Sharia law or to strict, you know, um, Islamic morality or, or and such. But what you end up with is, you know, if his son get ends up going to the schools, getting the uh, the indoctrination with like the LGBT agenda and stuff. And he ends up, uh, his, uh, his, the, the height of his cultural, um, uh, of his cultural exposure is things like star Wars and Marvel. And, you know, he buys an iPhone and eats McDonald's and stuff like that. What you end up with is a, essentially a, well, um, the, the perfect consumer really, because it's someone who's been completely removed from any kind of, uh, spirituality which would have any purpose which would give his life any purpose beyond consumption so um you know there is a lot of resentment which i think uh is facilitated by both the media and the education system i think that's undeniable but i guess in many ways i could kind of understand some of the resentment that what you see amongst them is a lot of uh in the in the case of the muslims a lot of them um the younger ones might actually be more radical than their parents or they'll get involved in social justice politics. And uh, maybe a lot of that is from the uh, unfortunate, the unfortunate circumstances that um, they've kind of been raw, uh, kind of multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism has robbed them too of what, of what gave their life purpose the same way that it has to Europeans. So it, it, it ends up that it, it makes a society that really no one can, re- that no one can really feel at home. And that, um, uh, I think that the reason for that is that it's designed to just perpetuate. It's designed to be spiritually dead so that it can uh, perpetuate maximum consumption. Yeah, there's a great line from Eric Hoffer. He said, you can never get enough of what you don't really need. And that really, I think, summarizes consumer society to a T. We multiply trivial options and we spend our lives chasing after things that don't really satisfy us. And because we're not really satisfied, we want more of it. It's another empty calorie, another chip. The, the restlessness of modern capitalist society really, I think, does boil down to the fact that people aren't getting what they want, what they really need. They think they're getting what they want, but they're not getting what they really need. Yeah, uh, Patrick Deneen, uh put it well that what he, what he described in, in his book, Why Liberalism Failed, uh, what he described was uh, anti-culture. And what he says is that uh, the, 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 what's really created by uh, liberalism is not multiculturalism, it's anti-cultural in that it's devoid of any real definable culture because it's all just been boiled down and... Uh, and replaced with replaced with nothingness this has been a really good conversation we've been talking for about an hour so we should wrap up can you tell the people out there where they can follow your work uh you can find my youtube channel endeavor on youtube and i'm also active on twitter at royal endeavor i have a discord server as well if you'd like to chat with me you can find me there too so yeah um check out my youtube channel well, thank you so much for this. I really have enjoyed this conversation. There are a lot of topics I'd love to dig into more deeply. So let's do this again soon. Definitely. Thanks for, thanks for having me on, Greg.